Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're joined by Dan DeLion of Return to Nature. The mission of Return to Nature is to provide a safe and healing teaching bridge for individuals and communities to recognize nature as a continual and abundant provider of nourishment, medicine, food, and sacred connection. And to help reconnect the perception that nature is the very source of our sustenance as humans. By sharing this unique way of seeing and teaching about the edible and medicinal aspects of wild plants, medicinal herbs, and mushrooms, Dan aims to help move humanity towards a nature appreciation-based paradigm which inspires people to forage, wildcraft, create tools for survival and primitive art, treat their own ailments with what nature provides us, and get a little probiotic dirt under their fingernails. Engaging with nature and tapping into ancient and sacred ways, we carve our intuitive practice and reawaken a self-reliant depth within that seems so lost in today's society. Dan believes that once we recognize and reclaim our oneness with nature and look around with new eyes, we realize an ever-present bounty that Mother Nature provides us, and we just may see that we never really left Eden. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hello there. Welcome to Return to Nature Hour. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time, and I'm excited to learn from you about foraging and herbalism, and then dive a little deeper into some of the paradigm-shifting ideas that really build into your worldview of wildcrafting and kind of that alternative lifestyle. It's, it's exciting stuff. Yeah, brother. I'm a big fan of yours as well, so I'm glad to be here. Before we get into everything, I am super curious about your origin into wildcrafting, foraging, herbalism. Uh, why don't we start there? Sure. Basically, I grew up in a time before the internet, and so I played outside a lot. And I didn't have the internet or a computer until I was like 14 or 15. So my earliest childhood memories are that my, my dad built a sandbox and my mom had a garden next to the sandbox. So I remember clearly hopping the little fence, the chicken wire fence, and eating tomatoes and peas, which my mom showed me how to do. Nice. And she, she always pointed out Queen Anne's lace to me for some reason. That was like her good friend. And then she always grew herbs, but not really for practical use, just kind of because they were nice and pretty. And then my dad built a tree house, like basically on what would now be considered like property, which you're not allowed to build on. And it was just basically a couple steps up, up a tree. And it happened to actually be black locust trees. And so and once a year, it would just flower and waft and the white flowers would be everywhere. And basically, I played with G.I. Joe's, you know, army men, Ghostbusters, and plants. Right. And plants like pokeweed, et cetera, were like my natural dyes. I would like, if a G.I. Joe got shot, I'd splatter him with pokeweed. And <laughs> so I got to know plants on a more instinctual level. And uh, then as I grew up, you know, went through school, I really wasn't a big fan of school. I liked to be outside. I played guitar until I just disliked school uh, enough to drop out of school. And then from there, I really started getting into downloading Terrence McKenna and Alan Watts and pretty much all these lectures and trying to learn about shamanism because my mom always used to bring me to powwows when I was young and my grandmother was kind of a spiritual mystic woman. And so as I kind of grew into the fact that my mom gave me the roots of loving plants and sort of exploring nature and then also photography, I realized that mushrooms were some of the most beautiful photogenic things that I could find. And so I started going out to this one trail near my parents' house and I took my grandma's smudge bowl that she had gave me and I would burn white sage in the forest. And just kind of feel, felt like I was praying to whatever Gaian entity was there, asking for help, asking for insight, saying, are you there? Are you there? Is there anything beyond? Wow. And so uh, for a while, what I did, probably when I was like 18, 19, is I would go there and I made a pact with Gaia, the Gaian force of some sort. And I said, 
teach me about mushrooms and it's either going to be a piece of garbage or mushrooms. So I, I follow the shape, the color and the size phenomenon and it would either be a piece of garbage or it would be a cool mushroom. If it was a mushroom, I'd photograph it. If it was a piece of garbage, I'd pick it up. So after a couple of years of that, I actually found uh, Armillaria melia and uh, properly identified it with shroomery.org and I ate my first mushrooms out of the woods and I just felt so incredibly empowered from that that I basically couldn't stop. And I just kept taking pictures of mushrooms and then cataloging them as far as photos on like my computer. And I'd learned one name and then it was like, okay, now I know one mushroom and then I don't know all the others, but I'm getting familiar with the shape and I'm pretty sure this is the same mushroom, you know, because of the variation of growth. And then uh, after some time of doing that, I became the weirdo, you know, in the family who's eating mushrooms and the jokes were, okay, don't eat the wrong mushroom, et cetera. Right. Um, so I got to the point where one time my grandfather, uh, who was very influential in my life, he actually said, where did you, where do you pick these mushrooms? And I told him, and he actually told me that that's where his grandparents came from Italy to pick mushrooms. Wow. And I felt like the ancestral sort of, you know, they say the lineage skips a couple generations. Right. But I really feel like in a funny way, we called to each other. And so I feel like I learned mushrooms from my ancestors, uh, even though I didn't realize it at the time. And so that seems to have built the foundation of, you know, just what started my passion for looking for mushrooms and then realizing plants are a heck of a lot easier than that and you know a <laughs> meal of mushrooms can only go so far and then from there i just started exploring plants as much as i could and making meals so that's a little bit yeah i mean that's a really vivid story where that spiritual relationship with nature was really your starting point uh, and a lot of people i talk to they get into mushrooms for whatever reason get into foraging wild plants and then they kind of over time cultivate that really deep spiritual connection or realize mm -hmm. you know over time that that's always been there maybe but for you it was like this spiritual connection with nature was what you were seeking and you were consciously going out and initiating that conversation with nature and i love that idea that you're tapping into your ancestors foraging lineage because i know mm -hmm. in countries like italy that is the case you pass down your forage grounds to mm -hmm. to the next generation so i think you were tapping into some subtle invisible energies there on your journey yeah. definitely yeah so it's interesting because it reminds me like so my grandma was just very mystical she was always into crystals and reiki and healing and all this stuff so she was a huge influence in my life and then yeah. once i started listening to terence mckenna lectures i just became obsessed with ethnobotany and indigenous shamanic plants and so you know i really came at it from sort of the psychedelic aspect and like finding detora you know, Deuteronomium and Jimson weed and learning about that whole history uh, really made me want to go to indigenous cultures and learn from them, you know. And although I have not, I mean, I've done that somewhat formally now, you know, amateur ethnobotany, it really started to develop like, wait a minute, this plant is right here. You know, mugwort is right here and it has this sort of ancestral shamanic tradition. So really that seemed to be what was the most curious thing for me and obviously psilocybin containing mushrooms were a part of that journey and they sort of brought me into oh there's food too you know yeah yeah i think i think a lot of people start that way that psychedelic relationship is a powerful one that definitely leaves its mark and i think opens a lot of people up to realizing that oh all mushrooms are magical what are these organisms right and i'm just really struck too with how uh, tactile and how uh physical your relationship with plants and mushrooms was from an early age where you were touching them and playing with them because that kind of relationship of touching really builds a, such a deeper bond than if you just read about it from a book or were just purely intellectually involved it's like no you need to be kind of physically involved with these organisms to really get really get a deep connection with them yeah i mean one of the things i love myth busting is you know and I've, I've got the one caveat for this but basically you can touch any mushroom in the woods even the most deadly poisonous mushrooms so you're good there and there's one caveat which is if you milk a lactarius you know a peppery milky and you put it in your eye holes or your nose holes 
that might be a problem. But generally, you know, I've had somebody like kind of chew me out for that idea of saying that you can touch any mushroom. So with the caveat of not putting, you know, lactarious juice in your eyeballs, generally they are safe to touch and interact with. And another thing that I always try to help people remember is the difference between, you know, our formal education platform is basically, I like to call it a binge and purge method. You know, you receive facts, you crap them out on a piece of paper, you get graded or evaluated from that. And next week, you have to throw all that out of your brain because here comes new facts. But in ecology and nature, you have multiple dimensions to your memory, including your sight, but also your sense of smell and your sense of taste. And those are how to widen the ability to remember this stuff. You know, sometimes it's the texture that gives you the key into a mushroom or sometimes it's the smell, you know. With the case of stinkhorns, for example. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a big part of it, is using, engaging all the senses to yeah. widen the breadth of, and dimension of the memory and what that, yeah. can, what that can activate within you. Well, one of the things that I've always followed you for is your mushroom foraging, like you just laid out with that example of touching any mushroom. I think you have some really practical rules of thumb for people, some really practical advice you know, that you share on social media and different videos and in your courses. But I know also that you dove deeply into using foraged finds as herbal medicine. Uh, and that's something mm-hmm. I'm getting more and more curious about, uh, especially in these times of COVID where, you know, I'm just staying away from any hospital or doctor's office. Getting, I think everyone's getting more and more interested in natural medicines. So I guess, can you share with us a little about how your relationship with herbalism has developed and then maybe we can walk through some of the basics of how you use that knowledge uh, in your day-to-day life and and how other people can use that as well. So basically one of the things is like the mushrooms, just coincidentally, you can really start with either plants or mushrooms or both, but the necessity to observe color, shape, and size with mushrooms, especially with like, for example, you go out and look for red russula. You know, and there's such nuances there. There's reddish, there's darker reddish, there's sort of red with a pink cap. All of those practices, as the tracker school in New Jersey, they call it brain patterning. So those are sort of what I would consider like our ancestral pathways of understanding shape, color, and size. So when applied to plants, I just think it's so important that we don't necessarily need to go out there and name things. We need to go out there and observe the different parts of plants or mushrooms, which we're not used to seeing. And so it's sort of like the more you break down your observation skills, how many people look at the margin or the edge of a leaf, you know, and that may be the distinguishing characteristic. So that's just something I feel like in my training was just the sheer love and enjoyment of What is it like on the underside of the leaf? What is the stem like? What does it smell like? What does it look like? All those factors are really important. So in my experience, I basically got introduced to culinary herbs. You know, my mom had the basic culinary herbs. And then I started to realize that some of the weeds that even my mom was calling weeds were also really medicinal. So I got really into identifying all the plants around my neighborhood, and I would just walk around. And Even though I knew that they were potentially contaminated with Roundup or anything, I would just stop to observe the color shapes and sizes, and eventually the names come. But I think what we do as a society is we want to take the top-down approach because of our training, and so we want to name things really quickly, you know? But it's almost like when you name it, you don't know anything about it. Right. If you understand it like a person, you know, what do you like? Where do you like to grow? What is your habitat like? What are you uptaking? What is your flower shape? What kind of pollinating do you do? What is your cycle? What is your fertility cycle? All of those factors just seem to really be, be the same training that help us to discern people and societal circumstances. I feel like that is your training in instinct and intuition. You know, then at in, 2010, I went to Heartstone Herb School, and by then I was already eating lots of mushrooms and weeds up out of the parks and woods, but they helped me to learn medicine-making skills, and from there I just dove in because my instinct was, there's going to be some pandemics. That's what's going to happen here. So in about 2010, you know, getting into the whole 2012 thing, right. um, I wasn't subscribing to anything other than the feeling like pandemics are probably 
going to occur. So I started studying herbalism uh, intensely more for concern of pandemics, actually, which coincidentally now seems to fit. Yeah. So here we are now looking at what about the fact that our backyard is full of these so-called invasive weeds and some of them may be helpful in the time of a pandemic. Absolutely. And I think more and more people are getting mistrustful of different you know, pharmaceuticals and vaccines that are kind of accelerated through processes that don't seem 100% safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think myself and a lot of people are turning to herbal medicines, but we don't always know where to start. Now with mushrooms, it's almost a little bit easier because they are so heavily marketed now. Uh, and so you have your big six, big seven medicinal mm -hmm. mushrooms that most people know about. It's a little bit more of a known quantity, but with medicinal herbs, you know, I know just through reading your work, there's things like yarrow and pine pollen and things that we don't think of as being medicinal. What are just a couple wild herbs that most anyone listening could find? And what are some processes by which you could turn those into medicine? Right. So, of course, obviously, you should always consult a licensed medical practitioner if you have a specific acute condition. There's of my course. disclaimer. And so with that said, basically your entire lawn minus like five plants is going to be medicinal and food. Uh, basically, the joke is that the invasive weeds are actually here to save us from trying way too hard. And that's kind of why they showed up. And I call it banishment Eden syndrome. Our whole agrarian model did not succeed in the sense of nature connection nor in abundance of food. So you can see that relationship with like if you grow polycultures in a permaculture style, you actually increase your yield of vegetation right. versus growing monocultures. How surprising. Well, nature is really good at that. It's called your backyard, right? And so <laughs> everything there minus like the way I, I, I like to break it down is I think I'm overestimating, but in North America, you have approximately 50 poisonous plants. Those are ones that you should not touch, taste, or mess with. Now that said, chemotherapy is quite poisonous. So there are a lot of uh, instances of research and studies being done about taking poisonous plants in the right dosage and frequency and actually turning them into pharmaceuticals. Wow. And so we do have, you know, I hear different things, but 70 to 80% of pharmaceuticals are still derived directly from plants. I like to put the image of people in people's heads that in the pharmaceutical factory, you do have a semi tractor trailer coming in through the back, like beep, 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 and they're sneaking plants through, through the back, and then they're isolating and extracting with the sense of, well, you cannot get consistency and you cannot get proper accurate dosage with using these plants because of one, what I would call a perceptual flaw, which I like to call isolated ingredient perspective. Yeah. And of course, the more we learn about plants and the human body, the more we learn about synergy, right, or the entourage effect. So I like to suggest what is the active ingredient in turmeric being similar to saying what is the most important organ in your body? And so I like to ask that and people will say your brain or your, your skin or anything like that. And then I like to remind people, have you ever seen a brain or a pile of skin walking down the street? So what is the most important organ of the body is the holistic system. Yeah. And so if you subscribe to Darwinism, right, survival of the fittest means that turmeric was not sitting around making junk DNA. It was sitting around trying to evolve itself to be more resilient towards apocalypses, towards environmental changes. This is classic Darwinism. So the active ingredient in turmeric is turmeric, the whole plant. And even if you're counting molecules and vitamin C levels, etc., it's not necessarily about how much vitamin C per se you're getting into your system. It's about how much you're assimilating. And that's a very different thing, which has, you know, an effect with your gut microbiome, etc. Right. So when you're looking to your backyard, you want to first isolate and identify all the poisonous plants and respect them, even though if you had the right lab and you had the right intention of people who had labs, they would be unlocking all kinds of medicinal effects including what's called cancer ap cell apoptosis, right? A lot of these poisonous plants actually cause programmed cancer cell death. And I have my theories as to why that might be. But for now, when you look at your backyard, a couple plants that anybody can probably find is 
For example, it's called plantain or plantago is the genus. And there's two species. There's broadleaf and narrow leaf. And it's always really important to observe your leaf. And so if you turn it upside down, you'll find that it has many veins or ribs, kind of like celery does, not like dandelion, which has a midrib. That plant has been with us in one way, shape, or form since the beginning of time. And it is food and medicine. Basically, the leaves are edible at any time. They're medicinal. Of course, that's a famous plant for chewing up and putting on a bee sting or a bug bite. It works phenomenally, incredibly fast. If you get stung by a bee or hornet, chew it up. You put it on there, all juicy, and literally instantaneously, it feels relief. So that's one of your forms of preparation. The plantain also can be at least a supplement to your greens dishes, if not the entire amount of greens. So plantago leaves and eggs or whatever it is, pickles your fancy, you can totally do. But I also love the idea of making plantain chips, ha ha ha, out of lawn clippings, or you can also call them lawnmower chips. And so basically the idea is if you turned a lawnmower into a harvester, mm. right, you could get a green juice attachment on the side called of the juicer and you can also chop the long clippings up and if you dehydrated them you'd have basically smoothie powder or dip some sauce in them and you can dehydrate them so the percentage of poisonous plants is way lower than we think so if you take 50 poisonous plants in north america and there's something like 30 to 100,000 i i hear different estimates from different people but that's not as much of a margin of error as we've been conditioned to think right so then plantago or plantain has these super edible seeds, which of course is similar to chia or flax in the sense that if you soak it, it becomes mucilaginous, which is a sign in nature or a signature, a signature, right? And that mucilaginous property always tells us that it's going to be soothing for our body. And so if you have something that is dry and hot and you put cooling and goopy stuff on it, that is actually now what we're catching up to as far as pharmacological activity. You can call it whatever you want. You can name it. You can isolate it. You can put your last name on that chemical. But basically, if you have a dry, hot condition, whether that's hives, poison ivy, you know, sunburn, and you put something soothing and cooling on it, it's going to relieve that, right? Or inflammation in the body or dry, cracking joints or anything like that. So the seeds actually are a cottage industry of potential, including crackers and chips and, you know, grain and gruel. And the seeds of plantain all have fat, protein, and carbohydrates, which are macronutrients versus micronutrients. So those are survivable food, and that's why it shows up in our doorstep. Wow. Well, that was a really broad and amazing breakdown packed full of information including some of the big properties i'm taking away or the big themes i'm taking away are that our lawn is basically like a grocery store for medicine mm -hmm. and food and i'm excited to see the return to nature branded lawnmower attachments one day <laughs> make turn your lawnmower into a smoothie machine yeah. turn your lawnmower into a chip harvester yeah. uh, but that's a really powerful idea it helps get rid of that idea of separation. It opens it up as a potential source of sustenance. A lot of this, I mean, you're talking also about reductionism, which is one of the greatest ills of our society is breaking things down, whether you're talking about science, whatever it may be, reducing everything down to one component part, instead of seeing that bigger holistic system. You know, there's this wisdom so inherent in nature that you're obviously tapped into that comes from millions, centuries, millennia of evolution that leads to a system that already is well balanced that we really don't need to mess with and we probably just need to understand and so all of these things bring us into this area of you know worldview like you gave us some really practical advice some really practical ways to approach foraging and herbalism but what i'm always struck by in hearing you speak is this whole other worldview that you're tapped into and in reading your website that becomes really clear is it's kind of this different way of seeing the world and i guess is that at its heart the the core of kind of rewilding because we hear that word a lot i think you're obviously engaged in that process taking us away from the modern dehumanized hyper industrialized society that we live in and reattuning ourselves with nature but is the core of rewilding shifting your worldview to be more holistic or, or what does that mean for you 
Well, I guess it's a matter of, like you're saying, this, uh, you know, reductionist model can only go so far. And one of the things I like to remind people is that your greatest herbal teacher is one sentence, which is as above and so below, as within and so without, which is the great saying of Hermes, Trismegistus, the thrice great. And that saying allows me to reflect the patterns from microcosm and macrocosm. So when you're observing in a way that's reductionist, then you might isolate the fact that a bee is more important than a flower or that a flower is more important than a bee. But really, there's something new that needs to be found there, which is that there is a dynamic of symbiosis between those two organisms, and they are, they are co-factors, they are co-reliant, and neither of them can survive or rely on themselves without the interdependence of all beings. And so one of the ways that I try to frame my observation in nature is that earth is my body. My body is the earth. Everything that worked on the earth for millions and millions of years has been saved and recreated. So when we look to habitat as parts of our human body, we can learn a lot about herbalism. Mm -hmm. When we look to the fact that a you know, one of my favorite examples is St. John's wort grows in sunny areas. It doesn't grow in the dark. It likes sun. You can say that's because of vitamin D, you know, it sequesters vitamin D. But also, it just helps with your mood because it's sunny, right? It brings yeah. happiness. Yeah. It brings in the light. You know, and so that kind of model, I think, is maybe what Rewilding is about is it about expanding your perception to understand that the patterns that you're witnessing, if they're good patterns, they have been recreated over and over and over. So one of the kind of things is you have these poisonous plants. Don't eat them. Once you learn about them, you could nibble test any plant, which means you take less than a pinky size piece, a pinky nail size piece, chew it up. You spit it out and you spit out your spit. And then what you have is a chemical analysis laboratory called your mouth. And it turns out that chemicals taste like things. You know, we all know this when it happens to be vitamin C. It tastes sour. Mm. Well, sour affects the body in the same way. No matter what the chemical name is, no matter what happens, it always increases salivation, glandular secretion. That helps with the you know endocrine system. That helps with your gallbladder, your liver cleanses your blood. So the sour flavor, if you sort of find it in these entities, in these organisms, it's always going to do a similar thing. My favorite example of that is obviously if you think about, here's what we do, right, as reductionists, what herbs are good for the liver? And then you get this list. And right. the thing you won't necessarily connect is every single one of those herbs is bitter to the taste because it's not that those herbs are unique and you need somewhere over the rainbow syndrome and you need to get them from really far away is that the best plant which will help your liver is the bitter herb that you're taking on a regular basis and so then it expands you to you know the six flavors my training is in ayurveda so salty sweet sour astringent bitter and pungent those are the maps of instinctually knowing what plants plants do inside of your body and the easiest way of doing that is discern the poisonous ones, don't mess with them, and then nibble testing them. And I feel like that is the core of rewilding because that's what our ancestors have done for millions of years. And furthermore, we don't really always realize that there is not one chemical in a plant. There's thousands of chemicals in plants, right? And every time you're nibble testing one of these wild species, you are putting a flood of chemistry into your system which is your genetic memory. All of your ancestors who ate that plant, suddenly all right. the neurons start firing. All the metabolism occurs as a result of that chemistry going into your system. And I feel like that is so fundamental towards sort of waking up our perception, our instinct. And maybe that's what I would consider a rewilding, is using the rest of your brain, using the rest of yourself as an organism to discern the atom from the system based on your senses. So it's reactivating those tools that are our senses and the processor that is our brain and, and the different component parts and what chemicals they can process and differentiate through how it makes us feel or how it tastes. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we've lost touch with that very basic part of our, of our body computer, if you will. 
Yes. Well, I think about mugwort, right? It's like the best way to know what mugwort does is you rub some in your hands and you sniff it and you actually observe your experience and you can learn what the book would tell you by actually having the direct experience, you know? And if you really sit there with yourself and you sniff it and you imbibe that and you're actually willing to drop into your direct perceptual experience, you will write the book because that's how the books were written. That is exactly the biological <laughs> process that we've been doing that has brought that information to us. Right. This is another thing I often think of when you talk about rewilding and returning to the way that ancient humans used to process information, this highly refined body technology that we have and things like mm -hmm. intuition and all those tools, are we able to also integrate discoveries that have been made through going down these various reductionist rabbit holes? And or is there a way these things synergize where we can integrate all the information and specificity from reductionism, but then still reactivate our, our innate human tools to be, you know, as sharp or as refined as they were in our ancestors. Is there a, a marriage here? Well, that would be the hope, right? So basically what we're saying is, will technology change our biological brains and bodies to a point that is unrecognizable? And do we want to go down that path? And who votes for that? Right. Or do we want to to be biological and abandon technology, or do we want to consider a hybridized model? And so obviously it's, I don't consider back to nature, I consider returning to nature. One of the frameworks for that I feel like is if you've ever heard of a spagyric, mm -hmm. which is an alchemical tincture, which is a little more advanced than making a basic tincture. But of course, everything in alchemy also has, has its sort of archetypal and metaphoric value. So I think about modern culture as basically a giant game of hide and seek, right? And you know, but do you know that you know? And so a spagyric means spagyric, right? Speos and geos means separation and combination. But what we forget in there is the secret word, so to speak, is purification. And so mm -hmm. we've separated everything into its individual parts. And we've purified and refined it, and we've we taxonomized the entire world. And now the goal is to reintegrate that all together, and that's the cultural spagyric, as I would call it. And so when we take our, our biological senses and we understand what is the balance with technology, I would consider sort of a model that would say, okay, you're living in a Paleolithic-type world, you have a bone setter, you've got the backup of pharmaceutical medicine, You've got the ability to get all the main technological aspects, but what do you actually need versus what is excessive materialism? And instead of going full throttle into excessive materialism with side effects including misery and depression, which we can <laughs> see statistically, yeah. people who have more things are not any more happy, right? And so then what is that middle ground? And I feel like we're in the crux of figuring that out in this decade. And we are never going to be able to turn back. And so there is a real concern with a lot of people that a hyper-technological world is coming. And then the question is what to do about biology and our biological instincts. And I feel like that has the key. One is multinational corporate technology. The other one is biomimicry. You know, and so also in your long clippings, you have biomass. That's cellulose. That's cellophane, that's toilet paper, that's all kinds of potential local cottage industry you know, solutions instead of relying on cutting down the Amazon jungle in order to wipe your butt with it. We could actually take the biomass of lawn clippings, <laughs> turn it into toilet paper, and there's a way to still embrace some aspect of our technological is advanced society with also localizing and engaging the local ecosystem. Well, and I think that's such a powerful motto what you just laid out, that idea of the spagyric, and that helps us get to that point where you can see how these things can be hybridized and brought together. We don't need to go all the way down the robot route, which is to, you know, the transhumanist dream, is to right. eventually um, have human consciousness uploaded into robots. We don't need these 
silly biological forms anymore. You know, eventually I, everything will be robot driven. And it's like, do we really want that? Or can we? I don't vote for that. No. <laughs> I am firmly out of that camp. But yeah. I think what people miss is, is like you're saying, they think it's all or nothing. Like we either go full right. biological back to paleolithic life or we go right. full transhumanist. And what yeah. it sounds like you're saying is there, if you apply consciousness, like with most things, if you apply consciousness, you can find that, that hybrid path that really right. is going to lead us to such a better place. And for me, I think a big part of it is deciding, do we want to really explore what it is to be human and make ourselves the most human we can be? And maybe that means the most happy, or maybe that means the most fulfilled. And I think a lot of people know that we're, that's not really a consideration of today's society. So I like this idea that if you apply consciousness, we don't have to give up the advances of technology, but we also don't need to be put into a robot body. We keep the good, leave the bad, keep those things that have like computers, like toilet paper, whatever it is that we use in day-to-day -day life, but do it in a way that's more conscientious and more in balance. Uh, um, but it's going to require people consciously re returning to nature. Hey, there's an idea, right? So <laughs> two two aspects out of that is one it's really hard to remain as a biological entity in this day and age and people are tuning out because you have to sort of feel and in order to feel there is some pain with feeling and so mm -hmm. the promise of this sort of transhumanist idea of you know a gram is better than a dam if you've ever heard you know read the huxley book the island and so the idea is like you could just swallow this pill and you don't have to feel the years and years of emotional trauma or the destruction of the earth and you know the ramifications of multinational corporate capitalism and so that's appealing to people who are afraid to feel because once you feel your biological instinct you feel it all you know the plant's right. going to say hey stop spraying poison on my head and turn me in a toilet paper at the very least if not put me in your salad bowl you know, and so that's one factor of it. And then the other idea comes from, you know, this is another alchemical idea, but it, Jung made it popular as well. It's called the coincidenta oppositor, which is that things that seem, the unity is in the duality. And so things that seem drastically oppositional actually end up being the counterbalance, you know, the genetic spiral or the yin and the yang or the shiva and shakti, however you say it. And so as thinking about this, I wish the application of this could be biology over technology, which would be like basically a way to ring in the economy, which is that if you want to do business as a corporation, you need to prove with whatever department, the you know environmental protection agency or whatever we have left after the Trump apocalypse, Trump apocalypse, you know, where you'd have to show by a report with environmental standards of how you're going to benefit the ecosystem, right? right? And if you just exploit the ecosystem, you can't do it. And I think about this as an example. Imagine if you wanted to salmon fish in the ocean and your first task was actually to stop by the fish and game of your local, you know, department and you get a trillion salmon eggs. And when you're out there, you dump them. And maybe 90% of them become food for everything there. Not such a bad idea. 10% of them proliferate. And so even that kind of methodology, instead of exploit everything and don't give anything back, would cause huge fundamental changes in the sustenance of how we're doing capitalism. And so that one kind of shift of what is the biological give back? What is the environmental give back? And not just some sort of greenwashing carbon emissions, you know, transfer. Oh, if I cut down a trillion trees and replant saplings, well, in 20 million years, we'll become carbon neutral. That's not really good enough. But there is a way to rein that in, or at least philosophically. I don't know if we have what it takes, you know, politically. I don't know if we have the gusto politically. We're that was going to be my next question is just what is the structure by which we implement some kind of change like that because what you're saying i know people are listening resonate with that and it seems so right. obvious right. it's like yeah why wouldn't yeah. we give people trillions of salmon eggs why we wouldn't we have people always like planting trees basically why wouldn't we have built a society based around just proliferating life proliferating natural life you know it doesn't mm -hmm. cost that much to do these kind of things so how do you make that change? I mean, is it something that's outside of political circles? Is it a philosophical shift that everyone needs to come to? Because once you get that's 
what I call kind of the curse of, of higher consciousness is once you're more aware, suddenly it's like this this mandatory lens through which you view things. Right. It doesn't suddenly you have to be conscious of everything. You can't let yourself off the hook. Um, right. Is that the road by which we get there, spreading this message and getting people philosophically on the right page, and then that change places out? Is it something politically that we can execute? Or is it something think, else entirely? I think it's an all in approach. I think we need all of those, you know, and, uh, mm. you know, one national holiday called National DMT Once Everybody Day. And uh, <laughs> we'll square that out real quick. You know, like the, the psychedelics are coming up at this time for a really important message to the humans and the plants, you know, all plants speak, but some plants scream. You know, and it's no coincidence that people eat mushrooms and take their shoes off and hug trees for the first time in their life. So that's a factor, you yeah. know, the spreading of mass spreading of information due to the Internet. That's a factor. The globalism as far as conscious awareness of the cashew industry and the coconut oil industry and, you know, where your products are coming from and what the conditions that awareness is starting to shift things now. It's not going to be given up easy because those that are doing the behaviors that need to shift are also still benefiting from them. And so we have one uh, melancholic hope, which is that as nature, be nature becomes more destabilized by the behaviors and the practices of the people, the kids who are misbehaving, um, we're going to have nature on our side as saying, you know, I'm going to heave you off. And right. as hard as that is for us to face, all of these things are coming to a head at the same time. So we need all of those methods in at once in an overgrow the system method. But also, number one is any of the ideas I'm talking about, take them. I'm, they're not patented. Take it. Make garlic mustard chips out of your backyard. If you want to put it in a plastic package, people will like it more. That's the kind of methodology I feel like if we can localize and do things from the ground up, then we overgrow the need for a large scale industrial system. And so that's where, you know, grow a garden in your backyard, start from there, forage some weeds, get to know your neighbors, you have a cooperative egg sharing, have some chickens in your backyard. All of those things end up shifting capitalism from giving your money to a multinational corporation who is doing an ethical business to giving your money to local people in your community or not needing as much of it. And so I really feel like it's kind of a farce to say that we live in a democracy. You know, we live in a right. capitalism and in capitalism, money is the, the real vote. And it's almost like everything else is a farce to keep you distracted from the fact that the reason that what you don't like thrives is because we keep handing it money. Right. And so to any degree that we can make those shifts locally, even if it's, you know, pick some blackberries out of your backyard instead of buying them from a corporation which has questionable behavioral practices, that might be a shift. And then it's a matter of, hey, are we here to be the paradigm shift? And is that going to turn on the whole world or are we building the hubs for the zombie apocalypse? And we just it's too early to tell, you know. <laughs> Either way, the solutions are the same. You keep right. doing what you do to overgrow the system, hyper-localization, you know, and what I'm taking away from this, a theme I love, is this idea of maybe not fight the system, but leave the system, disengage with the system, build your own systems. Even though it seems small, the fact is those small steps that you're taking multiplied exponentially over millions of people would make a huge impact. And what's critical at this time is we do have this tool of mass connection, which is the internet. So we have support system. We have ways of reaching out, sharing, giving people even the model of how to do this, even just sharing and showing people and inspiring people. And so it's been kind of more attainable than ever before to disengage from giant uh, systems of control because we have our decentralized nodes of connection. We have the start of that. And yeah, and I think that it is no coincidence that psychedelics are rising at this time. I guess this is something I don't often get into a lot on the show, but do you think psychedelics are something that if people take them once, especially like psilocybin mushrooms, that there is an indelible change left on them that makes them more conscious and more ready mm -hmm. for this kind of different paradigm? Mm -hmm. 
it really depends on the calcareous growth of the ego of the individual. You know, the first thing that came to me was Gandhi's quote, it may seem insignificant what you do, but it is significant that you do it. Yeah. Right. And so that's number one. Number two is would, I mean, I went down to Colombia and drank ayahuasca once. I don't do psychedelics mm -hmm. very often. I drank ayahuasca one time in Colombia with an 85 year old shaman and it was so powerful and so profound. I just felt like, wow, this would turn anybody around. Yeah, yeah. Although it really depends on the person. And so I don't think it's that every single person needs to do psychedelics. I think that some people need to be outer space explorers in order to bring back certain memes. And I really feel like this is the war on consciousness is going to be won through memes. And I mean that in a more generalized way. Meaning that when you see a solution that is easy and able to be done, people will jump on it. A good idea will beat out a bad idea. But it yeah. takes people going into either psychedelic or meditative or prayerful space, begging the universe to give you a sort of vision to crack the code, you know, and we're at the crux where things spread virally, you know. And so my inner quest with psychedelics, which, you know, I'll eat mushrooms once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, I'm talking about three to five grams in mostly silent darkness, um, prayerfully with an altar and respect and intention and vision questing and fasting, not necessarily, you know, throw them down the gullet as I'm driving down the highway. I'm not a fan of that. Now with that, my main focus is, wow, you know what the most done ritual on the planet and it has been thus far the Macarena. You know, the, the second most performed ritual on the planet was the ALS ice bucket challenge. And so yeah. that's us. And then maybe the third is like, what's that dance? I can't even remember the dance. You oh, know? I mean, now there's so but many that, TikTok dances that are doing that. Same right. thing. That's like the unconscious impulse to start bringing forth these memes or these rituals that if we could just get a handle on, especially with the aid and the guidance of psychedelic space with a prayerful attitude, it may be that you can crack open a portion of the matrix, you know, and that's sort of the digital alchemy of these days. Give me the tool that, that can awaken consciousness. So, you know, one of the ideas that I came with, which I don't think is profound by any means, but it's at least a little contribution is the idea of how can we get to the point where benevolent activism is just so benevolent it's it's almost trolling it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah instead of having an oppositional fight it's just like i can't even put this somewhere so what came to me was the idea of sidewalk chalking on public property about medicinal plant uses and getting other people to do that and if you get caught you know not only will you scrub it off if anybody has a problem you can just wash it off because it's chalk keep it on public property and then you could also offer to like, you know, wash their feet, cook them a meal, you know, be nice. And so it really kind of is almost impossible to get mad at. Yeah. You know, I'm just trying to help people become educated about local wild food and medicine that's available in a time of a coincidental pandemic. So those kind of ideas stretch them out, go for it, but nothing derogatory, nothing nasty, nothing on private property, because any time you get that sort of rebelliousness, that's exactly what the system wants. They want you to step out of that line where they could then punish and beat you and then make you an example all over national television. So if we could transcend that, if we could start to find memes or activities or engagements, which just feel benevolent, that I feel like is a way to kind of crack the matrix. I love that radical compassion, radical kindness. You know, my partner Shakti always says, just be nice. She's like the, the new future wave is just be nice. It's the ultimate key to so many problems. Uh, right. If we're just exhibiting radical compassion toward each other and toward how we operate in the world, what me memes we bring forth, like you're saying, that just totally diffuses the system's only mechanism of control, which is that threat of violence and reprimand yes. and all that kind of thing. So that's a really, really powerful concept. And I don't think it's any coincidence either that governments now, I believe it was the UK government, uh, started outlawing different memes. Clearly, the system and the power structures 
realize how effective a meme or just an easily infectious idea can be and are trying to put the clamp down on that on the internet i think right well they're watching you know and that's the hardest thing is so we have this brief time where the free open internet is you know oh gosh socialism in the sense of spread you know like we were talking before about mycelium you know right. and how mycelium is the midwife of all of ecology and its intention is to spread and diffuse the chemistry throughout all because the strength of the whole is greater than the individual parts and so mm. the, the plant mycorrhizal right mushroom roots 80 to 90 percent of all green species we see are connected to the mushroom mycelium and their goal is to create dispersion of information right yes. rapidly share dispersion of information and this is exactly I mean, the internet came from, you know, LSD heads, and that was kind of the overthrow the system method. And yet it's being, you know, the more you scroll Instagram, the more you're going to see commercials, the more it's going to turn into TV, the more things are going to be censored, all that's going to be happening in our time. So we have this brief window of massive sharing of information, but also you're seeing it's starting to be restricted more and more. And so this is the question of how do we utilize the moment? Yeah, we have to take advantage of these tools while they are still free and open. And biomimicry plays into so much of how we've developed our civilizations, our paradigms, the principles that we operate on. We relate so much to nature, find analogs in nature that we then describe why our society should be structured the way they are. And I think it's also no coincidence that it's this critical time people are becoming more and more aware of fungi as organisms mm -hmm. and how they operate. And they provide this really unique mental model of an mm -hmm. organism that operates in a way that's intensely cooperative and mutualistic mm -hmm. rather than strictly competitive, although they, yeah. they are competitive in a lot of senses. But it gives you some of these ideas. I mean, they have 30,000 different sexes and they have, so they give these different mental models to go off of that kind of open things up and give us some new ideas of how we can associate our own social structures or how we can associate our own relationships and a different a different lens through which to view them. So I think that's a huge part of the answer as well. Integrate a fungal perspective into mm -hmm. how we view the world, how we view ourselves. This understanding and this relationship with fungal organisms seems to make us better people somehow. This is something I wanted to talk to you about as well, because it is something that is becoming more and more prevalent during the pandemic times. People have more time at home. They're exploring more information. The solutions we've laid out to kind of pull back from this march down the robotic, hyper-controlled pathway, you know, applying all of those seems like it would be really effective. It could subvert the dominant paradigm. But what throws a wrench in that a little bit is this idea that society in general doesn't develop quite as organically as we like to think. And there may be controllers over the system. And we all have heard of the Illuminati and the deep state, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but this idea that there are families or just people who have amassed such incredible amounts of generational political, spiritual wealth, when you think of the church, uh, material wealth, that they then have set up these structures that dominate society and they're not going to give up that control. You know, even if we want to implement a lot of these solutions, you know, they may still purposely clamp down on them and try to keep things the way they are. You know, right. do we have to take them down first or does the return to nature solution set solutions of localization, of changing our mental models, finding memes, using radical compassion still apply and will still be effective, even if that is the case? Well, it depends on what we want to preserve as far as his history and populace. The human homo sapien will inherently survive in some way, shape or form, no matter what is thrown at us. However, mm -hmm. it does seem like there is, you know, a global elite who want the whole planet for themselves, you know, and don't really have the interest of the common people in, in mind. So. You know, the world is run by a cabal of narcissistic sociopaths, one way, shape, or form. We've given the power to the biggest bullies in school. And so the question then is, as I try to think about it, a doctor 
or a healer must study disease as well as cure. You know, mm. you're only as good as you do both. And so I feel like we need to continue to shine light upon the darkness, but also pose solutions at the same time. And that's, again, the coincident appositorum. We need both at once, and we need to stop bickering amongst ourselves as far as which one is more superior, because both are necessary. You know, it's like if you have cancer, it's very important to get awareness of the fact that that's actually cancer as well as know which herbs are anti-cancer, right? right? But if you don't know how to diagnose the disease, it's not really beneficial to just start throwing different, you know, herbs at the situation. So can we have both at once where we understand that the powers that be are not going to go for the green revolution? They are not interested in a grassroots movement towards, you know, organifying and sustainability and all these wonderful things scaling down right so think about high school you know there's the bully who constantly comes and steals the kids lunch money you know and imagine if everyone chose to just say you know what? i'm not going to react and i'm just right. going to keep doing this i see you i know what you're about and i'm not going to react i'm just going to keep doing this and i feel like that's different than responding right which is saying i know you and i see you and i see you're sick and god bless you and good luck to you and i see you and that, I feel like, is an incredibly powerful thing. And so criminal justice reform, making sure that the justice system is actually a viable phenomenon, is going to be a huge ally in the near future, not just a bribery you know, payoff scheme where people disappear and they get their own island you know, and they do corrupt things. And also this green revolution of the more we scale down, the less power we give them. I think it's going to come down to both at once. And there's no magical button, you know. And then the question is, how do we scale off of letting those people choose our experience? And again, it's funny because I see, you know, these political characters, whoever they are. Let's take, for example, Marianne Williamson was in the, the DNC debates. She's yeah. got a lot of really important and, and wise and empathetic and compassionate things to say. Which, by the way, you know, you talked about radical compassion. I believe it's a marriage of truth plus compassion. So you have to mm. have truth and compassion working together, right? So I don't know why Marianne Williamson isn't just like, screw this, I'm going to webcast anyway, and I'll just lead whoever wants to listen. And Bernie Sanders just like, hey, I'll do that too. And then maybe right. they can do podcasts and webinars and why not just Paul Stamets and Bernie Sanders and Jane Goodall and, you know, Marion Williamson and the people who really do have these good ideas, if they could just realize that we have gotten our election process hijacked and instead we could just choose to listen to the people who have good ideas. Now, that would put them in a compromised position and that's where things are getting pretty severe here. But I like the Occupy message, which I think got overshadowed by a lot of chaos and drama. You cannot evict an idea whose time has come. And so I feel like, you know, with a lot of these factors, especially, I'm sorry to say, pedophilia, it's becoming so commonly known where those people cannot silence through the methods they used to use. And so, you know, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, these people, even though they tried their best to silence people, the overwhelming power of strength in numbers has pushed them back into a corner and maybe that's to come, you know, more to come. Yeah, I mean, this also gets to an idea of is this the natural process over the ages? So you think of the ideas of something like the Kali Yuga and these giant cycles of time that maybe this is part of a natural process. Maybe we're thinking about solutions, we're seeing the problems and seeing how humanity has gone too far one direction, how there are, you know, psychopathic, sociopathic people that have accumulated too much power that are then using it in ways that are irresponsible. But maybe that's all part of this grand cycle that will eventually turn. And maybe we're at that point of the cycle turning. Do you think there's some truth to that, to that cycle? And I guess, does that absolve us of any responsibility or will that cycle only happen mm. with us participating and implementing these solutions you're talking about? Well, 
I'm glad you mentioned because I feel like waiting for the savior external to yourself is a big scam, right? Yeah. The Mayans will save us, the aliens will save us, everybody will come save us except for ourselves. We could keep playing that game because we like to think that paradigm shifts are time-based. So right. there's a whole factor, I believe they're ritual-based, and the right ritual needs to occur. And that's back to the meme, right? When there is a ritual which looks so benevolent, so awesome, everybody wants to do it. Like, this is not it, but pick up your garbage dance. You know what I mean? The pick yeah. up garbage in the woods dance. You know, something that's ridiculous, radical, and brings people to want to feel included is really, I think, the method that's going to succeed. And if we look historically, there's... A teacher, his name is Manley P. Hall, and he talks about astrotheology, yes. how the way that things went were not based on a time. They were based on the fact that a new ritual was brought forth, and it makes sense. So, you know, John the Baptist, for example, coming up and saying, I'm just going to dip you guys in water. It's a placebo game, and whatever you're feeling, pain, suffering, and negativity, I'll just dunk your head in there. And when you come out, voila, and there's a lot of power in that, you know? Yeah. And so now we're entering this age of what is the, what is the thing that's going to galvanize people that actually feels good and is benevolent, right? And that's, that's the emergency quest that we're on, which I feel like nature, dreams, the deep unconscious psychedelics are starting to reveal to those who are paying attention. And so what does that look like? And, and, and how does it become something that just undeniably feels good? There's something in there. Yeah. And when you apply that kind of framework of the rituals that we undertake dictate, you know, whether through esoteric or exoteric methods, you know, whether it's the physical outcome of the ritual or kind of the, the spiritual metaphysical workings of actually doing this ritual day in, day out. But it's that conscious application of ritual for a beneficent purpose because, you know, with what we do every day, we are doing ritual whether we mm -hmm. know it or not. So right. maybe we're engaging in rituals by sitting in traffic in your car all day. Maybe that's a ritual that we're all engaging in that's not getting us where we want to go. You know, we need to find ways of starting new rituals that, like mm -hmm. you're saying, are ridiculously good. And yes. that will get infectious. I love that idea. That will get well, infectious. And everyone will right. start doing these ridiculously beneficent rituals. Yes. And one of the great churnings of the unconscious, so to speak, is what happened at Standing Rock and the mantra, mm -hmm. water is life. You know, and this is where notice we have an element. Notice we have water level rising. We have concern for the the ocean. We have privatization of water. We have the bread basket of vegetables, which is California, drying up in drought. And you have the native impulse coming out of the earth saying, water is life. Don't forget this. We can't move forward without this understanding. And so that's like an elemental wave, right? And so also oxygen is life. And here we have I can't breathe. And that whole question yeah. of what about breath? And what is quality air? And how do we preserve that? And how do we not get that shipped to us on Amazon.com? To survive you know yeah. and these elemental aspects right are bubbling up from the unconscious and the question is how can they all synergize into air is life water is life food is life earth is life we got to cut the bull crap out kids and yeah. that's that's what's starting to come up and whether that will become a radical aggressive die trying phenomenon like last hurrah before you know the hyper technological mars culture takes over or whether it will be so practically grounded in the fact that people will just be like oh locavore movement i want local food and all the all the hippies become communists on their eco village farm and they're like hey why don't you come to our farmers market and try some actual water food air earth and culture and so <laughs> the, this is the question and Different temperaments have different moods. And so, again, back to the all-in approach, we need to not fight about what the fight is. We need to do it and work hard for it, you know? I love that idea that it's the elements, both the physical elements and how they 
nourish our bodies and are key to biological life, but also the elements and how they play in people's temperament and consciousness and and so many people that I talk to day in, day out. And, you know, maybe it's just the people I surround myself with or, you know, I'm in Marin County here in California. Maybe it's just where I am. But so many of the ideas you're laying out seem intuitively good to people. People just have a good reaction to that. I mean, whether it's talking about going out and exploring wild food, whether it's talking about empowering yourself by taking your own spiritual life into your hands and developing a connection with nature and seeing what spirituality really means for you, whether it's talking about, you know, a local food movement, growing your own food and starting farmer's markets. There aren't people that I know that would say those are bad things. So mm -hmm. it seems like it's just that act of pushing the ritual and pushing the doing of these things further and further out, like aggressively, we are aggressively promoting <laughs> local food. We are aggressively promoting right. foraging because then it infects people and they know it's good. So maybe that's part of this, this benevolent ritual that you're talking about. We just need to get it out there more and more because we've got the tools already or we've got the ideas already. Yeah. May the best idea win. You know, I mean, <laughs> the funny thing, which is, is a little hard to say in a way that's not offensive, but even the nationalistic impulse that you have in this country right now, yeah. is to our advantage, which is like, do you want to buy at the farmer's market or do you want to import from who knows where? And so right. we're seeing huge shifts even in the availability or the international trade relations or the economic system. We're seeing on every level the application of nationalism in this country is toxic, but the underlying desire to buy a local spoon from Joe down the street instead of import a plastic spoon from China is a good thing and it provides green jobs for everybody. And that's the thing where if we can now provide that sort of butcher, baker, candlestick maker methodology of saying, hey, who can darn the socks and who can help me change the oil and how are we going to develop a homeschool cooperative? And, oh my God, these weeds are edible and able to be made into tincture and food and medicine. You know, invasive weed harvesting plus certified kitchen equals local commerce revolution you know and that's yeah. the connection that we need to find and then you have funding to start buying up land and putting yurts and putting tiny homes and building eco villages right harvest autumn olives you're not probably familiar with them they're all over the yeah. east coast highest source of lycopene they can be made in a jam they can be made in a jelly they can be made in a fruit leather Oh, garlic mustard, another invasive species. That could be all kinds of ferments and, and dried, dehydrated chips. And that is really where all the jobs are really coming out of the earth to just work with the abundance that Mother Earth gave us in order to localize jobs. And that would be the easiest way of overgrowing the system, in my opinion wild food and just the appreciation of nature's abundance becomes a core part of any solution you're looking at. Again, this conscious application of the nationalist urge or the local urge, you know, not right. taking it to that nth degree where suddenly you're xenophobic and persecuting people, right. but really harnessing that idea that, oh, well, I want to support the people around me. I want to empower the local communities around me because that makes us stronger. It's like a mycelium. Right. It empowers those connections that give it life and loses those connections that are too far afield or aren't yeah. giving back to it in a way you're getting at this concept again, which I think is so powerful with wild food and increasing your appreciation for nature is we don't need to solve a lot of the big problems by finding something new. You know, we need this new economy. We need this new invention, this new industry. It's like, there's so many answers that can be offered just by understanding what's already here and mm -hmm. really taking the time to appreciate and figure out what we can do with what's already here. I love what you're saying there. And I guess to bring it back from this huge mm -hmm. level that we're looking at back down to Dan DeLion and return to nature, I want to talk a little bit about the classes you offer and how you educate people about these topics and offer these perspectives for people and, you know, how you're doing your work in the world? Uh, you know, what classes are you holding? Where are you holding them? Where can people find out more? 
So basically, I'm in a position like most people, which I was kind of hunkered down during the lockdown, and then things opened up, and I started to kind of feel out the waters. And so I'm teaching around the Northeast, mostly New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, just about every weekend. And generally, I'm making it up as I go, because I really feel like there's going to be some sort of more lockdown drama that's going to happen at some point. Hopefully, it can even get to the fall, if not before that. So I'm looking at you know, where is the best place to kind of position myself for a maybe somewhat of a harsh winter? And I don't just mean, you know, weather wise. And so I'll be teaching around that area. And I'm totally looking to, at this point, put up a yurt and open up a school somewhere. And I haven't found that place yet. So I'm obviously on Instagram at Return to Nature and Facebook, Return to Nature Skills. And my website is Return to Nature.us. Generally, I just travel not as far as usual. I've gone the last four years from New Jersey to California, California to New Jersey for six to eight months um, and travel wow. across the country. So I'm not sure if that's going to be available or feel right this year. And so I'm kind of just feeling it out like everyone else, what the next steps are. I feel like what's going on is we're shifting from this rational planning methodology to a more paleolithic instinctual pulsive mm you know, fight or flight sort of situation. So where do I go? What's the right place? What's the safe place? Seems to be what everybody's talking about. And so, you know, I'll be around the East Coast until I get the feeling that it's time to move. And uh, anyone's feel free to be in touch and connect and talk about all these things. And I'll be teaching. I'll be sharing about the nature every day. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, I know you teach people about wild food, hunting wild mushrooms, wild plants, wild herbs. But what are some other skills you dabble in? I mean, what are some of the other things you teach people about? Well, you know, I mean, my life has been about scaling down. My van is running on off-grid solar, so I basically use a minimal amount of technology, such as my phone, a laptop that charges on my solar. So I'm really into, you know, off-grid living and community building and sustainability as a whole and developing sort of cottage industry out of that. I'm also really interested in primitive skills and teach a good deal of primitive skills. But I think everything we're we're talking about, my main focus is to hold space for that. With every group that I have come, I always ask them kind of what their interests are. And we always go on tangents about some of these aspects because I feel like if this impulse to communicate about these things is stifled and we cannot find safe space to do it, it becomes identity politics and sort of online, I'll block you wars. And I feel like that is a very toxic expression of something that what I find is at my classes, I can talk about anything with people. And when we have human interaction, we don't do nearly the disgusting things that I see all over social media, you know? And so just, providing space for people to communicate about these things where we can feel each other and have eye contact feels to be like letting the throttle off of something that people need to talk about because they're stressed and they're anxious and they're not sure and they're feeling similar things but there's no forum a safe space so number one at my classes what i'm trying to do is teach about plants teach about survival but also talk about some of the cultural difficulties that we're having and you know, the environmental difficulties in a way that actually brings us back down to you, the people who showed up to this class, you're the people who voted for caring about nature in your local community. So get to know each other. And I hope through that, all the connections and all the solutions can come of it. I think that's been one of the most challenging things about this time is we do need that intrapersonal communication, physically being near the people you're talking with because humans co-regulate in so many ways you know whether it's the electromagnetic fields around our heart whether it's just picking up on people's body language the chemicals we're putting off pheromones exactly those are all such important things that i agree so much that you bring up some of these big issues we were talking about that can get politicized or subverted or you know people build straw man arguments out of things and when you get in that digital world just typing to each other you don't get really any resolution on discussing these issues or Mm -hmm. seeing other perspectives in a really meaningful way whereas with with people in person 
they can't just keyboard commando go off on you. You know, there's, they actually have to deal in the realm of ideas with another person in front of them. And I think mm -hmm. that is really powerful. And I wondered if all of this information kind of leaked out into your class where like, I'm going to teach you about survival skills, but mm -hmm. we're also going to talk about the world. I'm going to teach you what's going on on the planet. <laughs> That's that... a part of survival skills. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of one thing, which is sometimes I get social media people who are like, I wish you would just stick to teaching about plants. I don't like the politics aspect. And mm -hmm. I, I try to be equally disliking of all political factions, um, <laughs> you know, but people say I don't like the political aspect. And I my response is like, you want to forage, right? You want to pick wild food. You want to have land to pick plants well the environmental policies that our world's governments are choosing the pesticides that are approved the ability to spray aerially and foliarly you know things like bacillus things like roundup all over the planet those are political choices that leaders are making which is going to determine whether you have enough land to live off of or forage and the quality at which you can pick free food and medicine so it's very hard to separate an integral system where every bit of water has been recycled over and over and over on the planet. There's a finite amount and it evaporates, condenses, and rains over and over and over again. And so everything we do to the individual piece, we do to the greater system. And so it's very hard to say, oh, let's just talk about Plantago with our little our framework lens without looking up and out because the quality of oxygen determines the health and the resilience of the plantago. Yeah, I mean, it's all connected down from the micro out all the way to that big macro level. You don't necessarily need to know all the players involved or all the political parties, but to really observe that greater system and the resultant actions that they take and how it affects the natural environment, how it affects your life, and just at least have some kind of awareness of what's going on in that realm. I think that's absolutely invaluable. And I'm hoping that people listening don't mind me going down this trail because I think it is incredibly important. And I think you're one of the people at the forefront in blending wild skills and foraging with an understanding of the greater political sphere and how that's affecting us and seeing that they can, they can harmonize together and they're both hugely relevant to mm -hmm. operating on this planet well dan i know we've been talking now for about an hour and a half and i can keep fun. keep keep talking because you're a deep well to drink from of all kinds of insights <laughs> and knowledge and information so i definitely hope to have you on the podcast uh here in the future and i guess you've already given us some future plans where people can find you is there any other message or any other theme you want to just throw out there before we wrap up any big thing you think we may have missed here's my favorite thing this stays with me especially in the you know there's many factors there's you know i am a white male i have dreadlocks okay right. i am in a position of privilege as the time and place and circumstances shift and especially in the culture that we're in you know, with things like cancel culture, with things like internet shaming, with things, all these factors, right? Everybody's got something to say. I always try to say, if you have a feeling or an opinion, I will listen. If you want to come to my class and you want to be the teacher, you can be. You can say whatever you want. And the number one quote that sticks with me, there are people who will criticize you for acting. There are people who criticize, will criticize you for not acting. Might as well act. And so that's super important because we're all going to see just super wars about everything. And I would rather try my best and be a student to everyone than not try. You know? And so that's really just something that I repeat in my heart because I don't know what to do. I don't have all the answers. I don't have the solutions. Nobody does. But I'm going to try my darndest with the breath that God has given me in order to do something. And I'll always be down to improvise as long as someone has feedback that is beneficial. What a powerful insight, especially for any listeners who are European American, where we're dealing with this time where everyone's hyper aware of, you know, systemic cumulative prejudices against 
other ethnicities and other uh, people yeah. who share this land with us. I think mm -hmm. that is a huge thing we need to have is that humility and that willingness to still put ourselves out there, do what we think is right, and then have the humility to get feedback if people have issues with us or need to educate us. You know, we need to be able to just be brave enough to do that. Show me how to do it better and I will try my best. I love that. Well, because it is the Mushroom Hour, I do need to know, and I know there's so many you could pick from, but what uh, is the mushroom you love and why should everyone know about it? Oh, my God. This I'm a, a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Lactarius, especially the, the three species of uh, Lactarius volinus, Lactarius carugus, and Lactarius hygrophorites, brown to orange cap mushroom with white gills that milk and the milk taste is not spicy and orangey stems. I love those three because they're incredibly abundant. They're easy to identify. And I learned about those from a man named Ken Krause, who I studied with, and he lives in Boone, North Carolina. He's very well known in Asheville, and he is a green wizard magical being who literally is, if he carried a staff around with a big crystal on it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. He is a true green wizard. And so that mushroom really reminds me of him. And although I don't know any medicinal value to those mushrooms, which I'm sure will be discovered, I just love finding them. I love eating them. And they're not as commonly, you know, celebrated. So a little celebration for a lesser known group of mushrooms. And a little celebration for a green wizard. I oh, appreciate yeah. you. I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, I love that too. And a, a mushroom can bring back a memory or make you think of someone. And those mm -hmm. are some of my favorites. Uh, and then yeah. we've hinted, we've hinted at it somewhat, but what has a relationship with mushrooms? What is a relationship with fungal organisms given to you, brought to your life? And that could be emotional, spiritual, just perspective. Uh, what, what has that relationship given to you? Oh, it really puts the spirituality philosophically to the test, you know? So what I feel like is by working with, psilocybin containing mushrooms it sort of helps you to winnow the chaff out of your spiritual philosophy and beliefs and really tests to see what i'm made of yeah. and so that that really feels like one of the most profound mycological relationships i have is that you know so my study of vedanta and yoga and, and spirituality as a whole having the the feeling like the soul is more than just the mind and the body and, and five mushrooms in the dark at night is a really good way to see how much of that is a philosophical idea versus how much of that can be felt and perceived directly and so that is something that i i really appreciate the mushrooms for rigorously testing our philosophical and spiritual ideas seeing mm -hmm. if they hold see if they hold up against the scrutiny of fungal consciousness <laughs> scrutiny of fungal consciousness yes yes and then again it's something we've touched on in everything we've talked about but what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your body of work what you're sharing with the planet and this doesn't have to be you know personally how people remember you it could be just mm -hmm. how you hope you're contributing to a greater wave of awareness or something like that you know that's it's really interesting because i've taught plant walks for almost every weekend for 10 years. You know, this is the 10 year anniversary. I really started in 2010. And I have seen thousands and thousands of people and I have shared about dandelion and plantain to thousands of people. And, you know, I'm 37 and it's kind of like, what next? What will it do? What will it show? What will I die with? And it's kind of a, it's a current quest for me. And I don't mm -hmm. know. And what I hope is that a couple more people will have the green path opened up in their mind. And if I could just shift the idea that like, hey, some of this stuff is really useful. And that sort of then infects them, so to speak, with the idea of, you know, I should look at nature differently. Then I guess that's great. But I'm, I'm still currently trying to figure out what what it was all for and i don't know that i'll ever have that answer but maybe that's part of the mystery you know sometimes we just need to honor the mystery 
and have faith that the spores you're planting or the seeds yeah. you're planting are popping up and going to leave this amazing legacy that even if you aren't conscious of it, I'm going to guess that's definitely the truth. The 10 years of applying these principles and sharing this kind of knowledge, I'm sure that you've left a huge legacy behind you, even if you are never made aware of it. That's yeah. And, and like what I try to remember every day is it really doesn't matter. You know, what really matters is if people are reconnecting to the earth in a big way. I hope and I pray that I can be a link in the chain for getting more people to have that awareness because if we don't, we're going to turn into some sort of hyper-technological nature-discarding machines. And I'm not really a fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can play a role in that, but also, you know, we will be able to trace it back to you if there's like a viral TikTok pick up the trash in the forest dance, there you go. then you'll get some I'll kind of trying. feedback and validation. Yeah, but you know, it's like the ego is never validated and also never satisfied no matter how much validation it gets so it's kind of like a it's a joke you know i mean it's it's kind of like terence mckenna in a way is now like an internet meme yeah. you know like his voice is iconic beyond his actual individuality it's like he doesn't know that or something like that you know it doesn't matter in the same sense that it did when he was alive that's something hard for our ego to reconcile is the biggest impacts we may have and the true extent of what we offer to the world may just never come to our awareness. And yeah, everybody you know, loves you when you're dead. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I think I think the best we can do, we can hope to do is to, to at least integrate the ego. The ego yeah. is a terrible master, but a wonderful servant. Yes more sage wisdom and i just appreciate you coming on the show and sharing so much with us giving me plenty to think about plenty of new perspectives just when i thought that i knew it all so dan thank you so much for coming on it's been a joy speaking with you thank you good brother god bless you take care